So good evening, everybody, and welcome to our polycystic liver disease webinar, which is in fact the very first dedicated webinar to polycystic liver disease, PLD, that we've run. We sometimes do touch on it in, in our educational events, but uh, we're absolutely delighted that we're able to bring this dedicated webinar to you tonight, because we know how important a topic it is to everybody. So just a brief introductions tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tess Harris. I'm the Chief Executive of the Polycystic Kidney Disease Charity in the UK. I'm joined tonight by Susan Muirhead, our support manager, who some of you will know from having registered for this webinar tonight. And our guest speaker, Dr. Ahmed El Sakawi, consultant hepatologist at University Hospitals in Birmingham. We're also delighted that Natasha Martin, who's known to many of you on Facebook, is joining to give her PLD patient story, and she will be speaking uh, after Dr. Ahmed. Just a brief introduction about the PKD charity. Some of you may be new to the charity. I know we've got some overseas attendees on the call tonight. Perhaps you're familiar with the PKD Foundation and we're the UK equivalent of the PKD Foundation in the States. We were, we were formed so just 20 years ago by a patient and a kidney doctor and we're led very much by patients with clinicians and researchers and family members. I myself a PKD, uh, Susan is a, a kidney donor to her husband and uh, many of the trustees and members uh, who, who people who work with the charity are affected by PKD. Our vision is to improve the health and quality of life of people affected by all forms of polycystic kidney disease. And we do that by providing support and information to our community, uh, educational events like this, online at the moment, but uh, eventually we hope we'll be moving back to face-to-face. -to -face. And we offer personalised health and peer support. We fund research, uh, an example being the PKD Biobank, which contains over two and a half thousand samples of tissue from polycystic kidney and I think there's some liver disease um, uh, uh, organs and, and uh, uh, tissues from organs. And currently that's supporting over 90 basic science research projects in the UK. And this year we're partnering with the biggest kidney research charity, Kidney Research UK, to accelerate and fund more PKD research. We know there's a lot more that needs to be discovered and there's, uh, there's also not very much money put into PKD research. We're hoping to change that. And with the voice of PKD patients and families, we raise awareness, the impact of PKD and its kidney and non-kidney complications, both nationally and internationally. We're very fortunate to have the support of our national lottery, the Community Fund, who, who uh, have enabled us to hold this event tonight. Just a quick reminder before we begin the actual webinar, uh, this, so this is organised by ourselves, a charity for people in the UK. So just bear in mind that some of the health practices uh, and the health services in the UK may well be different compared with the way you live. We make every effort to ensure that it, any information that's provided is correct and up to date, but it's not a substitute for prof professional medical advice or a medical exam. And you should always consult your GP, pharmacist or other medical professional if you've got any concerns at all about your care or treatments. And we don't rec recommend any treatment or brand during our webinars and we don't promote any. This is purely an educational event. Lots of you will be used to using Zoom, I'm sure, but you're probably more familiar using Zoom in a meeting format where you can see everybody's faces. Because of the large number of people attending, we're in, you're in what's called listen-only mode. So you can see us, uh, but you can't, we can't see you. We know you're there because we've got, we can see your names. And so what we do, if you want to ask a question, we ask you to use the Q&A button and box. So you can see that uh, here, it's got these little speech bubbles in. Try not to use the chat uh, unless it's uh, for just, you know, to wave at us or whatever, because we'll be keeping a close eye on the Q&A. And we also have a list of questions that were sent in advance. That way we can keep track of all the questions that are coming in so that Dr. Armour can, can answer them. 
you can ask questions anonymously and we and we'll try uh, or Dr. Armand will try to answer all the questions but it may not be possible at the time so we'll try and do some follow-up by email so you can always email us at any time by info at pkd charity and uh, we'll get an answer back to you as soon as we can we are recording this webinar and I will upload it to the PKD website so you can view it later. So now I'm going to pass hand over to Dr. Ahmed. He is a consultant hepatologist. He, he was appointed uh, in that role at University Hospitals Birmingham in March 2012. He qualified from Southampton in 1999. And his clinical interests include all aspects of hepatology. So that's the liver. Uh, which also includes liver transplantation, viral hepatitis, muscle loss in liver disease and how to prevent it, and also, of course, polycystic liver disease. And as I said, immediately after Ahmed is uh, spoken, we will hear from Natasha and then uh, that your questions will be answered. In the meantime, do please start entering your questions as we go along in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. And I'll now ask Dr. Ahmed to share his screen. Thank you very much, Anika. I just confirm you can see my screen and hear me okay. Yep, lovely. I'm getting some thumbs up. Uh, so uh, good evening uh, and good afternoon for everyone on the call. Um, I must admit, I'm very impressed that uh, 74 of you have given up your time to come and listen to me today. Um, so my name, as, as Tess has mentioned, is Ahmed al Shikawi. I'm a hepatologist uh, at, uh, in Birmingham in the UK. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about polycystic liver disease. What we know, but actually probably equally as important what we don't know. Because I think it's fair to say there's a huge amount of information about this condition that we don't know uh, uh, at all well. And I hope to talk you through some of those, give a bit of an overview, but really what I don't want, oh, hang on, let's see if I can, uh, what I don't want is this for be a didactic lecture. I want to leave plenty of time for your questions. I'll try and outline what we do know, what the current recommendations are. Uh, again, emphasizing what Tessa said, this is coming at it very much from a UK practice, and I appreciate there'll be people from elsewhere where things are done slightly differently. But I'd like to outline some of the big unknowns. And again, this is your forum, please use it. Please admit, submit some questions into the Q&A, and I'll try my best to answer it. And if there's no answer, I will say to you, there is no answer, I just simply don't know. Or if I think I might be able to find the answer, I'll go away and find it and get back to you. So let's start with what are the forms of polycystic liver disease? And we talk about polycystic liver disease, but actually within that there's different forms. And it doesn't matter so much to you as patients um, in that the symptoms are all very similar, but it is important to understand that actually the research in one field may not necessarily relate to the research in another form because the genes that cause these conditions are abnormal. So these are the different forms. The first is something called the von Meyenberg complex, and these essentially result in very small cysts on the outside of the liver rather than the inside. The second form is polycystic liver disease, often abbreviated to PLD. And this is caused by different genes to those causing cysts in the kidneys as well. And when we talk about, as we will in a minute, autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive, in an autosomal dominant condition, you need one abnormal copy of the gene to get the disease. In an autosomal recessive condition, you need to inherit one from your mother, one from your father, so you need two abnormal copies. Hence, autosomal dominant conditions generally are more common because you only need to inherit one abnormal gene. So polycystic liver disease is an autosomal dominant condition. You only need one abnormal gene, but it's different. The genes are different to the ones that cause cysts in the kidneys. So most of, uh, of the of, of patients that we see, and indeed someone like Natasha, has autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease with liver manifestations as well. So those genes are different. Again, she's inherited one abnormal copy. Sorry, Natasha, to pick on you, but just makes it a bit more... Uh, uh, relevant. So they'll have cysts in both kidneys and the liver as well as in other areas and some of the complications that you're aware of, for example, problems with brain, brain aneurysms. And in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, liver cysts are said to occur in up to 94% of patients. Now that's not to say that 94% of patients have symptoms, it's to say if you look hard enough you'll find cysts in up to 94% of patients. 
and several genes have been identified that cause this condition. There's also the rarer autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, which I'm not going to speak about in any detail. So again, that's just a bit of an overview of the different forms. And again, I'm not going to go into detail, but the, these are some of the genes responsible for those different conditions that I've mentioned, okay? And more and more basic science research is looking into what these genes actually do and why they lead to cysts. And that's important when we come to design potential newer treatments in the future, although the field is still very far behind compared to some of the many other fields in medical uh, science. But why do the cysts form? Well, the cysts form probably not just because of the abnormal gene. And again, this is just a nice pretty picture to, to sort of highlight the issue. But the cysts form because you get abnormal little growths out of your bile ducts in the liver, probably that occur very early on in life, maybe even when you're an embryo. And those little cysts over time accumulate fluid. So when people say, I'm growing new cysts, the answer is no, the cysts are all there, they're tiny. What you're doing is you're accumulating new fluid in the cyst that already exists. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. And that becomes important when we talk about um, treatments and, and surgery, for example, and why the treatments are often only temporarily relieve the situation. Because the cysts are already there in your liver, whether they grow or not is one thing that we don't know a lot about. Which cysts grow and which don't, we don't know a lot about. And what is the rate of the formation of cysts? We don't know a lot about. And again, we'll come back to some of that in a couple of slides or so. But there are essentially different stages of polycystic liver disease. So as I said, the von Meyenberg complexes, which I won't talk about, I can't use my mouse, unfortunately, in the figure on the left, um, they're there in the periphery of the liver. They tend not to cause major problems. The other forms of both other autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease with liver involvement and polycystic liver disease or PLD as I'm going to call it are start off mild where you have a few cysts that are filling in they become more advanced and then can become very severe where virtually the whole liver is replaced by cysts as you can see on the picture on the right hand side I put in the references for those of you willing to wishing to go and read up the actual scientific academic papers and therefore, based on the severity of the disease and what we know about the natural history, we can propose sort of overviews to approaches. And I've just put this here to tell you that, you know, there are some good recommendations in the literature about what to do. But I'm only using this slide as an illustration that you can actually go in a stepwise manner in managing patients who have polycystic liver disease regardless of which form they've got. Uh, but I'll talk about the actual uh, ways that we do it in, a, in, a, in just a few slides. This is a really nice paper, uh, probably by the world expert on uh, post liver disease, a guy called Hugh Strength, who works in Groningen in Holland. Um, and this was actually uh, a paper in the Journal of Hepatology in 2017 with his old PhD students, Renny Van Aert, who I've had some dealings with. Um, and it starts off with a case and then it talks about the approach to the case and what the treatment options are. And that slide I showed you about cyst formation comes from this paper. But the thing to say is everyone is unique. Cysts come in all shapes and forms. So you can see, for example, in uh, picture A, and this is an MRI scan. And this is an MRI scan, imagining that you've taken someone and essentially cut them that way. At least you can see me so I can do that and you're looking inside someone from the front, but in depth, if you see what I mean, deeper into them than the skin level. And you can see, for example, in A, there's a few cysts predominantly at the top of the liver next to the diaphragm. In B, you can see that there's a lot more cysts in the liver, um, but actually the liver isn't enlarged. It's not down to the uh, pelvis bone, which is the little bone that you can start to see at the bottom. Whereas you can see in C, this is, this is quite a severe polycystic liver disease. It affects both the right and the left side of the, of the, of the uh, liver. It's a real shame I can't seem to use my mouse. Um, but, and um, uh, the liver is enlarged all the way down to the pelvis. So this is the sort of patients that we would see and see 
or we would maybe be considering a liver transplant. You can see that left kidney there has been really pushed to the side. That's the kidneys, the, the bright thing uh, towards sort of the bottom uh, half of your screen. So you can see the cysts come in all shapes and forms. But I think there's important things to say up front about polycystic liver disease. Although you can see the huge amount of liver tissue in this taken over by cysts, there's enough of the normal liver in, in the sort of the light green here that it hardly ever causes liver failure. So you don't see liver failure like you see in kidney failure with cysts in the kidney. The liver is al almost always intact from what we call a synthetic point of view, from a point of view of what the liver needs to do to clear your bilirubin, to form proteins that require your blood to clot, to form the album in your blood that keeps um, uh, the blood volume inside your circulation. But those cysts, as you can imagine, and as we saw with the kidney, can compress important structures around the liver, such as the inferior vena cava, the big vein returning blood to your heart, which sits behind the liver. And you can imagine if you've got a cyst pressing on that, it causes back pressure and you can get um, what we call peripheral edema or swelling of your ankles, essentially, and you can, because your blood circulation isn't able to come back to your heart as well as it should. The other important vein that can be squeezed, compressed, is the portal vein, which is the big vein draining blood from organs in the abdomen to the liver, because the liver is a unique organ in that it has a vein and an artery going in. It's the only organ in the body that does so. And the vein that's going in is essentially taking everything from your food, from your digestion, and filtering it through your liver. And your liver is really the big f factory and, and, and processing plant of your body, much more so than the kidney, or the kidney doctors would say otherwise. Um, much more complicated, but it's because of the need to drain blood from your bowels that you've got the portal vein. And back pressure on that vein can cause problems like accumulation of fluid in your tummy and dilated veins around your gullet that can bleed. It's what we call portal hypertension. And the other thing, and this is similar to in the kidney, cysts in the liver can bleed and can become infected. And liver cysts can be really difficult to treat. So uh, infections can be really difficult to treat. So sometimes they often they require four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. And if you go through cycles of different IV antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics through the vein, then you can get resistant bacteria that can become even more difficult to treat. And that's sometimes one of the reasons why we do a liver transplant. If someone's got complicated infected cysts that we just cannot get rid of with antibiotics or in the hospital all the time. So this is, I think, a really nice scheme and it's quite clear and it's from that skew strength uh, journal hepatology clinical case and overview that I showed you. The first thing when you, we diagnose someone with polycystic liver disease is to say, are they taking oestrogen? So if, again, it's much more common in females, this, and it's probably because of the oestrogen that most women have naturally in their body. And then for some, uh, the oestrogen and the oral contraceptive pill and there's also some evidence that pregnancy accelerates the rate of growth because again you're getting more oestrogens so you probably should stop if possible and think about alternative forms of contraception for example there are pills that just have progesterone which doesn't seem to have much of an effect or other forms of contraception then the next question you ask is have they got symptoms and if the answer is no then leave, leave the patient well alone if they have got symptoms then we define what the treatment goal is. The only curative treatment is removing the liver and replacing it with a liver transplant. But you only really want to do that in those with severe, really gross cysts, like the ones I showed you, gross by gross, I mean huge, enlarged, rather than gross, yuck, sorry, apologies. Um, and um, we use terms sometimes with, that have negative connotations in, in normal language. Um, so you either re a transplant is the only curative treatment, but we only really want to resolve those for those in the severe spectrum. And then halting the natural growth, and we'll come and talk about the medical treatments. It is possible to halt the growth. Reversing the cysts is not yet possible in polycystic liver disease, nor possibly maybe with tolvactam, which we'll come talk to about in kidney disease, but not in liver cysts. And then there are the other forms that different centers offer. So one is aspiration sclerotherapy, and that what that means is you suck out the fluid in the cysts, and you can see in this one, there's a one big massive cyst in the right side of the liver. You can imagine someone sticking a needle into that, sucking out all the fluid, and putting in something that irritates the lining of the cyst to cause it to block 
and not generate more fluid. And that you do if there's a single cyst, it's big and it's easily accessible from the outside. And that's often done by an interventional radiology doctor. So someone who, who's an expert at using imaging to intervene. You can imagine that you could do something called fenestration, which is where you essentially open the top of the cysts. And you can see here, there's quite a few interconnected cysts probably that are on the very surface of the liver. And you can imagine a surgeon going in there with a, with a, with a laparoscope keyhole surgery and just taking the roof off those. And that will create uh, some relief. And then you can imagine doing a reception. So on this slide, you can see that the left side of the liver is where all the cysts are, and the liver is split into right and left lobes. And the reason you can do a reception is the liver is the only organ in the body you can regenerate. So you can remove two thirds of someone's liver, and the third that's left can grow to the same size and function as it was before. So you can imagine in this patient, you can just remove the left side of the liver, that removes a lot of the symptoms, a lot of the cysts, and leave the right side. So those are the treatment options, essentially, summarized in a single slide. So we've talked about the types of surgery, and the type you're offered will depend on, as I've already shown you, whether you've got severe symptoms or not, where the location of the cysts are, and going back to this slide, whether it's superficial or deep, the number of cysts, but I think really importantly, it depends on the expertise of the surgeons in your local center. And so, for example, uh, if you go to a hospital where surgeons aren't used to operating on the liver or polycystic liver disease patients, they may wish to refer you elsewhere. If you go to a, a center where they just offer liver surgery, they may think about the defenestration or the resection. If you go to a liver transplant center like I work in, the surgeons are often reluctant to intervene surgically because they're thinking, well, there's cysts in both lobes. Even if I remove the predominant cyst in one lobe, I know this patient's going to get cysts in the other one. And I've just made any potential future transplant difficult because what you get after any operation is what something we call adhesion, scar tissue in the lining of the abdomen, the so-called peritoneum. And that just makes any future operations more difficult. And the more difficult an, a liver is to get out, the more complicated a transplant operation is. That's essentially why often in the big transplant centers, surgeons are reluctant to offer some of the operations that we've mentioned. And it also depends on the potential need for liver transplant. So if you've got someone, and this is one of the big unknowns is the timing of a liver transplant in someone, for example, with a failing kidney, but has also got symptoms from their liver cysts. When is the best time to think about a transplant? So if you've got someone whose kidney is deteriorating, you're thinking actually they're going to need a kidney transplant and they've got symptoms from their liver, you may wish to think about delaying any intervention for their liver until you do a combined liver-kidney transplant. And again, in the, in the discussion, we could talk about that uh, and the experience of that. And then the next question is, well, how successful is the intervention in the surgery? As I've mentioned, the cysts left in the liver continue to grow. So it often provides just temporary relief. And one big study uh, that I was able to find uh, in the literature, about 186 patients who'd had an intervention for polycystic liver disease, showed that a complication rate after partial liver removal was 21% of se severe complications. So one in five patients had severe complications and 2.7% death rate at a year. So it's not without its risk liver resection. In the right hands, with the right patient, with predominantly one-sided cysts, it's probably great, but not everyone can be offered it because of the risk of complications. So it's best done in centers that are used to operating on the liver, ideally in centers that are used to operating on polycystic liver disease patients as well. Okay, how about drug treatments, medical therapies? The main one that's been studied is, is, is something called somatostatin analogs. Somatostatin is a gut-derived hormone and essentially what it does, it works by reducing the amount of secretions into the cysts. They're given as injections. There are long acting forms that can be given once every four weeks. But the trials that have been done have only looked at the effect of being on them for six months to three years. So we have got no long-term follow-up trials. And it looks like they maybe in the first six months can reverse the cysts in some patients, and we can't predict who those patients are, but actually overall, they just stabilize the liver size rather than reversing them. So if you've got really bad symptoms initially, 
they'll get something potentially getting worse. They may give you a little bit of relief, but they're not going to shrink the liver back to normal and reverse the symptoms. And the other issue I have is in England, I can't routinely prescribe some of my analogs for polycystic liver disease. So they're, they're, they are used in other indications, but they are not funded on the NHS for use in the UK for polycystic liver disease. And in some patients, they have significant side effects, tummy pain, pale stools, diarrhea, and they encourage the formation of gallstones. So it's important that when we talk about somatostatin analogs, that to say that, yes, they might work in a subset of patients, but actually in the United Kingdom, I haven't got access to them very easily, or not at all. And this is a summary of some of the early trials. And as you can see uh, on the left-hand panel, perhaps, you see a reduction in the liver volume initially in the first six months, that reduction shrinks in, in the next following six months up to a year. And when you stop the lanreotide, you go back up on your liver volume. Um, and you can see on the right hand side with octreotide, similar things, but those what we call confidence intervals, those error bars in the charts are very big. So that there'll be patients who respond really well and some patients who respond very little. Uh, and so it's important to say that actually, we needed more research in this and we need more long term data on the safety and the effectiveness of this in, in, in a positive liver disease patient population. There are other, a couple of drugs to briefly discuss. Uh, UDCA or urza deoxycholic acid is a synthetic bile acid. We use it in patients with disease, autoimmune diseases of the bile ducts, something like primary biliary cholangitis. And in a single study from u Strengths group, it was possibly found to have an effect on halting liver cyst growth in ADBPKD, so in, in autosomal dominant PKD patients with liver cysts, but not in polycystic liver disease patients. So going back to that sub-analysis, and that's why I emphasize the difference at the beginning. We need another bigger study to validate the results because those were small numbers. I've tried it in a handful of patients. It hasn't made a difference to their symptoms. I've not systematically studied their liver volumes, to be honest. And then the other drug that many of you will be familiar with is Tolvaptan, which uh, the kidney doctors are using. There's some evidence that reverses the size of kidney cysts. Obviously, it prevents the decline of, the liver, of kidney function in those with declining uh, GFRs, glomerular filtration rates. But the receptor that Tolvaptan targets isn't present in the liver. And so the, the studies that looked at Tolvaptan in patients who also had liver cysts didn't show any difference in liver cysts in terms of growth. So that's important to say. But it goes back to, I've said, if the patient has symptoms and severity, how do you assess it? And I think that's where actually as doctors, we need to improve a lot. So there are validated, again, from the Dutch group, quality of life questionnaires of polycystic liver disease. And this is just an example of the beginning of the questionnaire and the kind of questions that, that, that it asks, okay? And if I ask my patients this, I know that many of them will answer yes to these kind of questions. And as I said, the most severe patients may need liver transplant, and I'll, ask, I'll, I'll leave you to, to Natasha, and then we can maybe discuss liver transplant. But I think this I declare as a, as a conf not conflict of interest, but as a declaration up front. I think having a polycystic liver is horrible. I think there are many unseen physical, and perhaps more importantly, psychological consequences that a lot of doctors don't appreciate, living with that abdominal bloating, that pain, with that discomfort, day upon day upon day. And a lot of healthcare workers that you will meet won't understand this. And probably, more importantly, are probably ill-equipped to deal with many of them. And actually, we don't have many answers to, to how to manage the symptoms of polycystic liver disease. I've told you what the management is. A lot of those are very drastic measures to take. Um, and, and really, ideally, in, if I'm giving this talk in 10 to 20 years, we'll have things that reverse liver cysts, and that will make everyone's life a lot better. And then there are lots of really important unanswered questions. I've already mentioned what is the best timing of liver transplant in someone with combined cysts and a declining kidney function. What other medical treatments should be tried now that we're understanding more about the genes involved and about what we call the pathophysiology, the way the disease evolves? But even something as simple as what is the rate of growth of liver cysts? How does it differ between men and women with polycystic liver disease? How does, sorry, excuse me, how does this differ between polycystic liver disease and autosom autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. There is lots of unknown questions that we really need to try and get the answer to. 
And so there are lots of research opportunities. And I'm glad that we hopefully finally had ethical approval in the last two months for a UK registry study to just at least try and define some of the patients we have in the UK. And hopefully some of you in this call will be asked to take part in this registry study. It's an observational study. It's trying to essentially collate information about the symptoms, about the disease burden, about the size of the livers of some of the patients in the UK with polycystic liver disease. It's being coordinated by a gastroenterologist and hepatologist, Dr. Richard Aspinall from Portsmouth. Uh, Richard has got four UK centres. Uh, I'll be the lead in Birmingham. Um, there's Cambridge is recruiting patients, but that's mainly the renal physicians. Uh, and Sheffield, again, uh, is recruiting patients to this UK registry. And I say, we'll hopefully start to highlight the gaps in our knowledge and encourage development to more clinicians with an interest. So it starts as a sort of a nucleus of a focus that hopefully we can expand. So I'm conscious of time. But that, in fact, was my last slide. And I'm happy to take any questions in the Q&A, but I'll hand you over to Natasha and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Thank you. So over to you, Natasha. I think we just need to unshare. Yeah, my mouse is playing up, I'm afraid. Hang on, let me try this. Um, let me see if I can kick you out. I see if you can kick me out. Like, yeah. Really is, yeah. Sorry, hang on, let's try that. Yes, I've done it. Sorry, here we go. And I'll mute myself. Can you hear me and see me? Can you hear me and see me? You can, lovely, thank you. Oh, we I can, forgot. we just need to see your screen. Yeah, just sharing now. I forgot that I can't see you. <laughs> so um, I give me the thumbs up, please, Dr. Ahmed, if you can see, um, I'm assuming you can see my, my screen. So, hi, uh, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. What a pleasure. Um, I've been invited to speak for 10 minutes or so. Um, my slides, I absolutely I hate PowerPoint presentations, so I've just decided to since, um, give you lots of pictures, but don't worry, they are not gory pictures because Susan told me I couldn't put them up, so uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I'm Natasha O. Martin, I'm 43 years old and I live in Berkshire in, um, in a lovely little village called Mortimer in the south of England. Um, and I have, uh, I've got AD, PKD with PLD. And um, as, as Ahmed was explaining, I was um, unfortunately one of the very, very minute number of people that with uh, PLD who had it quite severely. I'll just change my slide. Advance to the next animation. Ah, lovely. So who am I? Well, uh, First and foremost, I am um, a, a wife, um, although <laughs> the picture of my husband has disappeared. It should be in that blank white area, but he, I, I am a wife. I'm a cat mummy. I am a uh, daughter, a sister, an auntie. I work in sales, so I'm a salesperson. I'm a friend, I'm a crafter. And also, uh, and it doesn't define me, I'm a polycystic kidney and liver patient. Hence my tiny little pictures. I love life um, and I always have done and I always will do. Um, there was an episode in my life that I regard as a couple of years that um, I was severely affected by PLD, but it's over now. Let me tell you about that story. Oh, and there's Robert, sorry, he, he appeared there. That's my husband. So let's talk about um, the timeline um, to a new life. So I was born in um, May in 1977. In actual fact, I was born on the 25th of May, 1977. And um, that's the true Star Wars day because that's the day a Star Wars, A New Hope was um, premiered in Hollywood. So uh, I'm really proud of that fact, as you can tell. Um, I didn't get a diagnosis until I was 23. Um, and I had my diagnosis um, at Guy's in, in London. I lived there at the time, I was at university there. Um, and the only reason I had the diagnosis was because I had been skiing with a whole load of friends and I'd fallen down the mountain. Uh, that sounds more dramatic than it was. I had a fall and I twisted myself quite badly. 
And anyway, I got back and um, I had a pain that just got worse and worse and worse. And it turned out I'd had a ruptured um, cyst, a bleed into the cyst, which got infected, causing me to have my very first, um, I guess, episode of uh, sore kidneys. And the hospital um, took maybe six months after that to diagnose me with ADPKD. Um, it is in my family history, but nobody had told me about it. So it was brand new to me. And of course, I guess, um, like loads of you out there, you told you've got ADPKD. And that's your lot for now. You, you don't really get anything else from the doctors at all, particularly if you've not had any family history or know, it, know of it that really runs in your family. And interestingly, at the same time, when they were giving me my, um, my scans and so on, um, I was also diagnosed at that time with having cysts in my liver, with polycystic liver disease, but not my pancreas. Now, I was chatting to Tess um, about a week ago, and apparently to have an, a formal diagnosis of polycystic liver disease is actually quite rare. Most of you will have been told you've got the cysts in your liver, and very much like when you're first diagnosed with this um, cyst in your kidney, you're sort of just, you're not really told much about it and you're left on your own to just get on with life, which is fair enough, I suppose, initially. So um, moving on a few years um, back in 2015, I started having a few health issues. My blood pressure started going up. Um, I spent, throughout that year, I, I've spent, 10 days in hospital with various different things. Uh, one of which was a six day stint with another cyst bleed with a severe infection. And I think at that stage, that's when um, I'd had I, things started to develop. Um, still a bit young at this age, I think, but you know, it happens. It's my style of PKD, I suppose. Um, a couple of years later um, in 2017, um, I was put on Tolvaptan because at that time, my kidney, my GFR started to decline a bit. Um, but it, when I say a bit, it was quite a rapid decline. It jumped about 20% um, in, in about three months. So they put me on Tolvaptan. Um, at the same time as that, I started to notice the symptoms of my polycystic liver. Um, and this is where I became, I guess, um, a bit lost because you don't see these symptoms written down anywhere, or at least I couldn't find any. The first symptom I had um, was, it was a sensation of my, uh, I thought I, my bra was really tight. In between, my sternum um, became numb and I couldn't feel the skin there. Um, and I thought my bra was tight, so I got looser bras, but no, it just wouldn't go away. And the numbness began to spread a bit um, around my middle. I also started to get a few blood blisters on my skin as my skin was stretching getting a bit bigger from the liver inside it became numb and blood blistery um, and so I started complaining to my renal specialists because they were seeing me for Tolvaptan every month um, but um, also my liver was now seemingly visibly getting bigger and bigger every month it was growing quite rapidly at this point um, and in um, February 2018, I was complaining so much, I absolutely demanded to my renal, my renal people to um, refer me to hepatology. And so my doctor, um, Dr. Bandari of the Royal Berkshire, referred me. He actually wrote a letter to Ahmed, to Dr. El Shikawi, who he had seen in a, in a recent webinar himself um, talking about PLD. So he wrote um, directly to El Dr. El Shikawi, who agreed that he'd see me. So that was in the February. Um, and for some reason, NHS always seems to write to me very quickly. So for the following month in March 2018, I actually got, um, I travelled up to Birmingham from, um, from Berkshire and I got to see Dr. Ahmed for the first time. We had a conversation. He agreed, he looked at my um, scans, um, which, and agreed that my liver was vast. Um, and at this stage, it was sort of coming up to my chest up here and it was sort of that sitting down into my groin as well. So it was um, on the slides he showed earlier, it was definitely the one right over on, on the right hand side of his slide. It was a, it was a big liver. Um, we discussed it um, and he said, well, come back and see me every year until such time something else happens. Well, two, uh, a couple of months later in the May, um, 
I had a rupture in my cyst, um, in my liver, sorry, um, another bleed and a bleed in the liver. Um, it is really weird. Um, it, it doesn't feel the same as a kidney um, um, bleed. Um, it's just as painful, but it's a different feeling. It felt fizzy. It felt like a Chinese burn. Um, and I certainly couldn't move. I was coughing, breathing. It was just painful. So um, I referred myself straight back up to Birmingham. On, and on May the 16th, I got to see one of um, Dr. Shikar, El Shikari's colleagues, Professor Mutima, who immediately said, well, have you got your head round transplant yet? And at which point I just said, yeah, no, um, I haven't, because we'd always been led to believe that kidneys were the ones we think about, not the liver. Anyway, so um, I uh, went through the assessments at Birmingham and I was uh, put placed on the um, liver, uh, on the transplant list, the end of July. Um, and it must have just been my lucky year because, um, well, throughout the summer 2018, I had um, an awful lot of problems. I was in bed by three o'clock every day. I couldn't do my shoes up anymore. Um, much to my chagrin, I couldn't have a massage anymore because I couldn't lay on my tummy. Um, I couldn't breathe. Um, it, it was, I was really struggling basically at this point physically um, and my quality of life had just, well, um, my husband would tell you, I was just, I could, I was cancelling tickets to theatres and I just wasn't working as hard as I should have been at work because I worked full time. So it was really hard. So, um, but I did get the call um, in 2018 in November on the one o'clock in the morning. Um, they said, we've got a liver for you. Can you come to us in Birmingham? So I did. Um, so um, up, up I went to, to Birmingham. And um, I just want to show you that on the next slide is pictures of me semi-naked. So um, turn your eyes away now if you don't want to see that. But this is me, and my husband took these pictures um, about half an hour before I was taken down to the theater. And I wanted to show them to you um, because, um, well, I guess I'm proud of the size of that liver, look at it. I was always being stopped for um, uh, being asked when my baby was due or my twins were due. Um, I was, uh, people would stand up, uh, let me sit down on the bus, which wasn't a bad thing, but anyway, it was hard carrying that thing around. So, um, I'm sure quite a few of you on here will probably appreciate uh, that they also feel and look the same. It didn't really, the look didn't really affect me psychologically because I, I never really cared what I look like or what anyone thinks of me, but I know and appreciate a lot of people do. So um, anyway, that night at 4 a.m. on the 8th of November, I went down for my, I think it's eight or nine hour um, operation um, to have it removed. And then 42 days later, uh, <laughs> My eight kilogram or 1.3 stone or 18 pound liver had been removed. Uh, and I, I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, wow, I, I can actually see my waist for the very first time. So I was quite happy with that. Hadn't appreciated how, how big I'd got basically. And then um, just on my final slide here, I just wanted to show you some of the things I've done, been able to do after that. So um, you can see in the top left-hand corner, this is my, my um, cabinet full of drugs. Obviously every transplant patient has an awful lot of um, drugs that they have to take every day for the rest of their life. You get used to it. Um, but very, um, um, very quickly after, I think in the March uh, 2019, I traveled with Tess um, to a polycystic kidney seminar. So that where it says a problem to, up here, um, this is me down here. I was I was a panelist um, for a big two day symposium in in Belgium. Um, I've been um, walking or running, um, raising money for PKD charity. This is my lovely surgeon, um, Tamara Pereira, um, Dr. El Shakar. We all know him. He's like the hero, the super god of um, liver transplant, and he is he works at, at Birmingham and he takes out a lot of um, polycystic disease, uh, liver. Um, livers. Um, I've totally forgotten the name of this guy, but he's another surgeon that also attended me, but he's, I think he's his boss, but anyway, I'm sure Ahmed will tell us later. Um, about a month later, I was also on um, one of the uh, podcasts at Birmingham um, University. Uh, so I look a little bit pale there because I still think I was a bit sort of getting over the, the transplant, but that was literally four weeks after my transplant. And um, ever since I've been always very heavily involved in the PKD charity, just sort of, you know, put myself out there. So um, thank you very much.
Um, and uh, I guess back to test so that we can um, look at um, our uh, uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. <clears throat> and your cat. <laughs> That's in the background. Sorry. So, <laughs> no problem. So we've got questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Dr. Hubbard, if you want to yeah. reply to them direct. Are you comfortable I, I, typing I, in I, the I, box? I, I, I've typed in some answers, but I thought some would be better to share. And then please don't feel that I've dismissed your answer if I typed it in. I've just thought that one's an easy one to do. And I'm just trying to do a couple of things at the same time. So apologies. Um, then we'll start with Patricia, who's um, asked that my main issue has always been my kidneys. I was officially diagnosed, uh, had PLD a couple of years ago, but the size of my right side gave me a hint. Should I see a hepatologist? I thought this was an important one. So it, it is... It's one of these situations where actually if your kidney specialist feels comfortable scanning your liver and assessing the size and assessing your symptoms, then fine. Equally, your kidney specialist may not feel comfortable doing that without actually um, asking a hepatology opinion. Now, part of the issue in the UK is that the number of specialist hepatologists up and down the country is very small. And, and as I mentioned before, the number of people with an interest in prostate liver disease is actually even smaller. So... I think the answer, the straightforward answer is yes, you should see a hepatologist, but be prepared not to be fobbed up, but be prepared to maybe face someone who isn't used to seeing someone like you. So if you're not happy with the response you get, you may wish to come to one of the bigger centers where someone with an interest is. Um, now, unfortunately that may involve travel, but having said that with uh, our, our, one of the only silver lining of COVID, one of the very few is that we're now much more used to performing remote consultations. So, for example, someone could send us the scans and we could talk to you on the phone and get your symptoms that way, uh, get your blood test done at your GP or whatever, and then advise you accordingly. So, yes, that's a possibility. Uh, do you want me just to carry on? I'm just conscious. I don't want it to be a monologue. Um, I'll turn it up to you. We have received many questions prior as well, which I've yeah, so Susan, do you want to tell us one of those? Yeah, a couple of those and, and then we'll go back to the questions. A lovely yeah. one here. We all know about inheritance of PKD. Someone yeah. would like to know, because of PKD patients, are their children likely to inherit PLD also? Yes. Yeah, so, so the answer is, like I said, so if you've got, if you've got a condition where you need one abnormal gene um, only to cause a disease, and there is, there is, when you read the literature, it's just not not just the presence of the gene, because even in the, in the kidney disease population, we know, for example, that people have the genes, but they don't necessarily have the kidney cysts or the kidney disease. So there is what we call variable penetrance. So just having the, the actual abnormal gene doesn't necessarily mean that you go on to develop the disease. But there is a risk of them passing on, just so that there is a risk with, with PKD. And if you've got pure PLD, not the one associated with kidney cysts, but the one with just liver cysts, then yes, there is a chance that you pass it on, absolutely. That's an interesting one there. And cyst growth, I know we have covered it with those lovely slides that will have answered some of the questions we've previously just had. But people are wondering, do liver cysts ever stop growing? Mm -hmm. So the answer is uh, probably not, but we don't have enough what we call longitudinal follow-up data on a sufficiently big number of patients. Um, and that's part of the reason why the, the registry studies that we're taking part in with the UK on the four UK centres, it's happening in Holland, it's happening in Spain, it's happening elsewhere in the, I think Korea as well. So I think once we've got big numbers in big data series, you can answer some of those questions, but probably not, but we don't know for definite. And another key one that's come through is how much of the liver has to be affected by cysts before it becomes, loses some ability to function? Or is it the sheer size that is the problem? Yeah. So, so as I said, liver failure is extremely rare in, 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 in post-cystic liver disease. In fact, I'd go as far as to say I've not seen a case. What I have seen is complicated infected cysts that require transplant, severe symptoms that require transplant, or, and I know it's one of the questions, um, pressure on the portal vein that the only way to relieve that is to replace the liver. How do you know, the question we ask, how do you know whether there's increased pressure on the portal vein? Well, you blow up with fluid around your tummy, you get what we call ascites, and that's fluid around your tummy, free fluid around your tummy that might require draining. 
Um, and also you, you might start vomiting up blood if you've got dilated veins at the bottom end of your gullet. Uh, but again, that's a rare complication of polycystic liver disease, but it, it is recognized. Mm -hmm. And lots and lots of questions with hormones. Yeah. HRT combination pill. Even down yeah, so to plant-based hormones. Yeah, so, so although, I don't know about plant-based estrogen, I saw that question, I don't know the answer to that, but <laughs> um, I just don't know the answer to that, to be honest. And I'd have to look and see whether the receptor, the estrogen, if it binds to the same human estrogen receptor, then the answer is it will promote cyst growth. Mm -hmm. um, is is HRT associated? Yes, almost certainly. And when people ask me about HRT, I, says, I say to them, well, Depends on how bad your symptoms for polycystic liver disease is. Depends on how bad your postmenopausal symptoms are. And it's a personal choice. If you think you can live without the HRT, that's probably better for your liver. Although we don't know for definite, we'd have to follow you up and see. Um, but if your postmenopausal symptoms are terrible, then take it because your quality of life is suffering more from your postmenopausal symptoms right now than it is from your liver. But but keep reviewing it. Keep saying, well having that discussion with whoever's prescribed the HRT, can I stop it now? Can I stop it now? Can I stop it now? And often there's no right or wrong answers in medicine. And sometimes people expect us to know. We don't. Sometimes it's a matter of trial and error. Absolutely. And we've also received some questions regarding diet. Is mm. there any specific dietary changes that the population can make with PLD? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's any good research into diet. Um, one thing we know is good for liver, generally, is coffee. Uh, coffee, generally, any form of liver disease that people looked at, is uh, coffee is good. But it's mainly good to prevent scarring in the liver that's associated with different forms of liver disease that cause cirrhosis. Uh, no one studied coffee in polycystic liver disease. So I, I think the answer is no, but have a couple of cups of coffee a day. And I'm watching the time there, and I can see we've got lots of online questions too. A final question that seems to be recurring is pain and treatment mm. for PLD pain and management. OK, so the answer is treatment for pain is similar to treatment for pain for anything else. So it's it's if you can deal in the underlying cause, we've said that's not easy uh, in terms of liver cysts. You one of the things I think is important is if your liver is working so you can take paracetamol as per normal because people worry about taking paracetamol with with liver problems, but you can take you know, if you want to be super cautious, you take only four tablets of paracetamol a day. But you're probably fine going up to the normal prescribed limit of eight a day. Um, you know, some people find the standard things, hot water bottles help. Um, you know, not having a very big meal overnight before you go to sleep helps. Um, if you bloat as well, keeping a food diary might be helpful in determining which bits of food do cause more bloating. You may have people who have IBS uh, and polycystic liver disease. And so the advantage of something like a FODMAP diet, which is something to do with the amount of uh, complex sugars, and you can look it up online, FODMAP is all capitals, F-O-D-M-A-P-S. It's very helpful for people with IBS. And maybe following a FODMAP diet for some people with polycystic liver disease may help. But uh, the answer is there's no specific uh, extra treatment than the standard treatment for pain. Thank you so much. And I see as we were chatting there, we've had more questions come up in the question and answer. Do you want to have a quick look through it with perhaps Tess? Yeah, like, yeah, she's managed yeah, to keep yeah. an oh, eye Tess, have you, have you kept an eye on it? Is there some themes emerging? Oh, you're on mute, Tess. Yeah, there's a very interesting question about somebody who's had a, a, a live kidney. Yeah. A live transplant. donor kidney transplant. Yeah. And the threat to me is, yeah. So would those surgeries, because you described earlier how you get adhesion yeah. and complications, yeah, yeah. would that yeah. be a barrier for a liver No, it wouldn't transplant. be a barrier for liver transplant. It might make it slightly technically more difficult, but where the kidneys are is behind the peritoneum that I've mentioned. But often with the, with the kidney, with the donor infections, the kidneys are so large, they have to open the peritoneum to get it out. But it's one of the conversations that Nick Inston, who's one of our main kidney transplant surgeons in Birmingham and I often have is what's the timing what what surgery do you do are you really disadvantaging them if they might need a liver transplant if you do an nephrectomy first the answer is our surgeons will probably deal with it 
it at the time of a transplant, as will most surgeons are up and down the seven transplant units in the in liver transplant units in the country. But it does make the operation more complicated. And the longer it takes to get your 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 own liver out, the more the organ that we're trying to put in deteriorates because it, it, it up to now livers are traditionally sat on ice. Actually, that's changing a bit because now we've got perfusion machines. That's a whole different conversation for another day that I don't pretend to be an expert. Tamara Pereira and John Isaac, uh, Natasha was the other surgeon you mentioned. Uh, Tamara certainly is one of our big Birmingham advocates of machine perfusion. So this is when you take the organ, you put it on a machine that keeps it at the same temperature as supplies oxygen. And that allows us to, to really stretch the transplant operation in terms of getting the organ out. And so in the future, that will make a difference. So, so no, the answer is doesn't preclude it. I've gone around that in a roundabout way, but no is the answer. I've got a question for, uh, actually Natasha might answer it, but first, um, lots of people are asking about your registry study and whether they yeah. have to be attending that particular hospital, those people, yeah. to take no, part. No, so and probably can we not. And promote it via the charity, of course. Yeah, uh, probably not. I mean, none of the centres are open because literally the ethics was mm. November, December, and we're all, all normal research and development has been put on pause because of COVID. Uh, so certainly I'm nowhere near opening it in Birmingham. Um, it might be easier in terms of consent to, for you to at least attend once and maybe we can get your images and your historical blood tests, but there's also at least one visit in the study. So you don't have to be attending, but it might be easier if possible uh, to attend. I mean, the other thing is, I don't know whether Richard, for example, wants other centres to join. It might be that he does. So if you've got a centre, you go to a centre where you know there's a clinician who's interested in polycystic liver disease, ask them to get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do. Great. So a question, I think Natasha could answer this, um, which is to do with psychological impact. I'm wondering uh, what or how we as patients can do more to increase understanding of it because uh, there's such a stigma about well, there's probably kidneys and liver, of course, and people are often dismissed in terms of their symptoms and the impact it has on mood and body image and all those other things. I think it, um, it, it it's quite tiring um, being asked all the time when's your baby due. Um, and yeah, I guess that I'm, I was the right age and I'm female. So yeah, it's, it's the, the, the go-to question. I went, I went to Disney World in 2017 and the amount of people told me I shouldn't be standing in the queue for so long. Um, it just, it was funny at first and then it just wasn't. But also when people say, well, when there's a baby due, you have this little thing that comes into your head. Well, I'm going to have to tell you now that I'm not pregnant and I've got, uh, I'm on the transplant list and and then the worry about how that's going to make you feel when I've just when I'm about to tell you it um, it I've, I have to be honest no one n no one in the medical professional um, medical community ever asked me about it and um, I wasn't offered any psychological um, help before or afterwards quite possibly because I'm quite um you know defiant and, and stoic anyway um, and I'm sure if I'd asked for it I would have got some but yeah, um, certainly it's not taken into consideration. It really is about, uh, you know, my quality of life was, I, I can't go out in the evenings anymore. I can't do anything anymore. I can't do my shoes up anymore. Um, I, I, I tried really hard to keep moving and to keep exercising right up to my, um, my, um, my transplant day, which really helped. Um, and the way I dealt with it was to, to tell everybody about it as, as an, if they were interested, a bit like what I still continue to do today, I find it really cathartic to be able to share with people how my struggle, <laughs> my struggle, my the, my my life, uh, and because I know that it can help other people. So I think that's how I deal with it. So. Thank you. Um, come come back to a more clinical question about. Um, reduce kidney function post mm. liver transplant and there's another mm. related one about taking tovaptan or whether it's uh, mm. having cysts or PRDs also. I have a, you... an anecdote about that actually mm -hmm. Tess. Um, mm -hmm. After my um, transplant my kidney function increased by another by 20% and my blood pressure returned to normal so that was 
I don't know if that's normal. That, Ahmed, have you ever no, seen that before? No, no. So it's but not. It's really it's not interesting. <laughs> it is really interesting. I, I, I was pre-warned that that might be the case. So the, <laughs> we, we, we in general say that you lose about 10% of your kidney function after a liver transplant. And that's because of the stress of the actual operation. And about one in six, one in seven patients, regardless of whether they've got kidney disease pre-transplant, end up on kidney replacement after the transplant because it's such a big insult to your body. And then we do nasty things as doctors and we whack you on immunosuppression with tacrolimus and that affects your kidneys as well. Um, so, so the answer is, yes, for some patients we do uh, kidney, uh, liver transplants and they start off with a GFR of 60 and for many years it can be, you know, in the 40 to 60 range and it doesn't cause any problems. But in some, we may accelerate kidney decline. Again, no one can predict it. And, and and it just needs a little bit of a light touch when it comes to immunosuppression after a transplant. And so if you're in that situation where you've had a liver transplant, ask your doctors, how are my kidneys doing? Keep a keep pattern. Do you, I need to be on as much immunosuppression as, as because one of the other th important things is you need less immunosuppression for a liver than you do for a kidney. Okay. Just a couple of minutes over. Are you okay just to, if there's anything yeah, else? Yeah, another couple of minutes. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some of them have sort of been covered. I mean, but there's quite a lot of people talking about people their various... 84 participants still on. Very impressive. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few uh, people referring to their symptoms, basically, yeah. and asking, yeah. is this a symptom? Uh, so you've talked about bloating. Yes, that presumably is a symptom. Um, bloating, heartburn, back pain. Heart... Back pain is yeah, really common. Yeah, back pain. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's asked about night sweats. Uh, not traditionally, not unless you've got potentially an infected cyst, but then it wouldn't be a care, you'd be ill. Mm -hmm. So no, no, not traditionally, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody asked about trauma, because... Trauma, to you, cystic liver, that's a very good point. In the a, cysts on the kidney, yeah. we're often told, be, be careful. Yeah, exactly the same in the liver. In fact, the liver is a bit more exposed because it's, it's, it's it, especially when it's enlarged and effectively there's no rib cage to protect it or spine the other side of your kidneys. So yeah, we say avoid all non-contact or uh, contact sports and just try and be careful what you're doing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, diet, so diet type question. Uh, well, not really diet, but uh, statins for cholesterol. Would that affect liver if you're taking statins? Uh, not per se. Well, so there's a very rare risk of liver uh, in injury from a statin per se, but no, absolutely a lot of our post liver transplant patients are on statin for, statin, for example. So no, if you need to take a statin, take it and just have an eye kept on your blood test. But having polycystic liver disease does not increase your risk to your liver of taking a statin, if that makes sense. Not as far as I'm aware. Okay. And uh, I'll do, I will end up with one one final comment actually in a minute, but um, somebody's asked something specific about something possibly called costochondritis. It might be a misspelling of. Yeah, so I answered that. So costochondritis. Oh, you've answered it. Okay, great. Yeah, I've answered that. Um, costochondritis is inflammation between the cartilage and the ribs. Um, and um, you can imagine if the liver's enlarged and it, or if you bloat, you're sort of moving that all the time. So I can easily imagine that causing inflammation in, in there. And the treatment is painkillers and anti-inflammatories if you can take them from your kidneys point of view. Um, but it can be a nuisance, I, I agree. But I, can't, I can imagine that it would be a, a, a potential complication, yes. Okay. So I think most of them ha have been um, more or less covered by what you've said. If anybody does feel that their highly specific question hasn't been fully answered either by the talk or in some of the answers given, do please send us an email to info at PKD Charity. Um, before I thank everyone, I would just like to say that somebody on uh, who's attended today has uh, told us that they have had a liver transplant for 26 years and are still going strong. So I think that's a, a <laughs> fantastically upbeat uh, way to, to end the webinar tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Ahmed for giving up his time and for such a very nice, clear talk and um, for, uh, and, and, you know, covering the key points so well and, and answering the questions tonight. And Natasha, for your story of, patient, of, your, of your journey, I won't say struggle, of your life and journey, and also for giving, I think, people uh, sort of 
strength in being able to advocate for themselves, you know, as, as both our speakers have said, don't take no for an answer if you're just going to, to a really new it and they're looking at you blankly. You, you are entitled to second opinion. And if you're having any problem at all, just come back and speak to us at the charity. We can always find somewhere to refer you to. So with that, I would like to say thank you all. Thank you everybody for attending. It's been a really fantastic talk and hopefully the next time we do this we'll have some research to tell you about, maybe some, some something about the studies, <laughs> um, some positive uh, news for, for everyone affected by PLD. Great. Okay, be patient with us and apologies if we haven't answered your question. Don't take it personally, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all and good night. Thank you.